Hey there, everybody, and welcome to Real Time, where we are live here on YouTube talking about film and TV and everything in between. And today I have a very special guest who is going to be talking about how to keep your craft during this time in Corona. And it's none other than one of my best friends, Razwan Jigani. Let's get right into it. Okay, we seem to be having just slightly technical difficulties. Just give me a moment. All right, here we are. Sorry about that, y'all. So, yes, welcome back to Real Time, guys. My name is Mustafa Talib here uh, with Cinema King Productions. And I'm very excited because uh, today we're going to be talking about how to keep your craft during this time of corona. And specifically, uh, we have a very special guest with an awesome performance with none other than Razwan Jagani, the violist. And uh, today, let's see, because of his background with music, I thought it'd be a great opportunity for him to come on and talk about how important music is and in the film industry and television and, you know, why is it important in our lives? So with that, Let's go ahead and bring him on where there you are. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, Razwan Jigani. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, my brother. Wa alaikum assalam. Thanks for having me. Thank you for doing this with me, man. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, so first, let's kick things off by quickly introducing yourself. So I'm a professional violist. Um, I'm not someone who just does it for fun on the weekends. I have uh, majored in this um, educationally. I just finished my master's last year at Carnegie Mellon University in music performance. That's awesome. Um, I'm currently doing a post-master's certificate called an artist diploma at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And inshallah, all goes well. I'll be doing my doctorate in musical arts starting next fall. That is fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. So let's just get right into it. Um, what, I guess, drew you to being a musician growing up? I feel like I was always exposed to it. I remember my parents used to play classical music in the house a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Like I would know famous pieces without even knowing what the piece was or who wrote it just because I heard it all the time. And I've always sort of been a performer. I distinctly remember in my preschool singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer as a soloist yeah. um, in front of like all the parents and whatnot at, um, uh, at our holiday concert. And then when it came time to enter middle school, when I, was, when I moved to Plano, um, I had a friend who played viola. He was two years older than me. And I was thinking, oh, he thinks it's cool. It must be cool. And that's actually <laughs> when I picked the instrument. Little did I know that I would probably hate playing the viola for two years because I didn't know we never got melody in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got, when my parents got me my first legit instrument and we started playing better repertoire in uh, like orchestra class, I grew to absolutely love this instrument. And mm -hmm. um, at one point, it came, it came that I would have had to choose an academic subject over music. I tried to make them work together. Um, and then I ended up realizing in undergrad that music was my true calling, and that is why I decided to dedicate my life to it. That is fantastic. So uh, being a musician, right, can you tell us what is the importance of the music slash the score in, let's say, film or television? What does it do for the audience? It, well, I personally believe that music has a profound effect on the soul. And... Mm -hmm considering right now our life feels like a horror movie or some right. sci-fi movie we can't wake up from, people are turning to the arts for comfort. Now, in a cinema setting, for example, you have mu music heightens the emotional energy of a specific scene. You right. know, if you have a scene that's very epic where a lot of action is happening, your music is going to elevate that. 
If mm-hmm. you have a scene that's very emotionally driven, whether it's sad or happy, the music is going to amplify that. And a lot of times people don't entirely feel the scene unless there is music. Mm-hmm. Even silent films like Charlie Chaplin films, they may not have dialogue, but they have music. Right. And that is what allows you to feel what is meant to be felt through the, uh, through the movie. Now, everybody mm-hmm. feels things differently, mm-hmm. but... That's, but the music is not designed for you to feel something specific. The, desi- the music is designed for you to just feel something. Yeah. So basically, you'd say music or the score, and even you could say to an extent sound design, uh, sets the tone for the film. And it's, you know, with the direction of the director to uh, wanting the audience to feel a certain way during a certain time that we're going to play this thing here. And of course the composer uh, is going to make that happen. Absolutely. And like, that's why you usually have a separate person for that job. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, it could be the composer of the score or it could just be someone who is, you know, calling all the musical shots based on what the the primary director is doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes the director will go to the composer slash music director and say, you know, this scene depicts this, write something based on this. Or sometimes, the music director will have already written something to the um, to the idea of what the scene is supposed to be, and then the mm-hmm. director will base the scene off of that. Um, I think the best example would be um, the, the the famous shower scene from Psycho, um, mm-hmm. when Bert, um, when Alfred Hitchcock originally did that scene. Apparently, people were laughing. Then mm-hmm. Bernard Herrmann wrote that famous score. Mm-hmm. And that is actually when people started to feel that sort of terror that, you know, right. someone can come into your shower and kill you. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. For the lack of a better way of putting it. Or, you know, John Williams' famous scores for Star Wars and, um, you know, the early Harry Potter movies. You know, mm-hmm. you can't have that epicness of a battle scene or a Quidditch match without a score to support it. Correct. Correct. Okay. So coming back to you, what big projects uh, have you worked on yourself? So I guess apart from my academic degrees, which are undertakings in them of themselves, um, Alhamdulillah, I have released two albums. Uh, My most recent one I released was last summer called Endless Night, which was a compilation of eight musical theater tracks that I orchestrated, produced, arranged, recorded at Carnegie Mellon University as part of my master's degree. Um, Then I've, um, I've done two music videos with you. Um, yes. Uh, back in uh, 2016, um, hopefully can hopefully I can do more once you know the Rona disappears, yeah. uh, or is at least controlled. And at the same time, I always have little things going on. I'm working on YouTube videos constantly, so I'm always arranging new things, trying mm-hmm. to keep myself busy. Um, I'm working on repertoire for my school as well, so you know I'm learning new uh, classical repertoire in addition to you know my non-classical stuff. And mm-hmm. that's essentially what's keeping me busy. Um, as far as projects are concerned, I always consider a new piece, whether I've written it from the ground up in terms of the the orchestration or the track that I'm producing, or even something that's already written, how much I've been sort of chunking at it and learning it. I think those are all projects, and those are all essentially arrows in my quiver. Okay. Okay. That, that sounds awesome. Um, let's see. So this is going to get a little personal. Sure. What challenges have you faced in your journey to becoming a musician? So for those of you who do not know, I'm half Indian, half Pakistani, uh, Eastern cultures, which do actually favor the arts um, as a form of recreational entertainment, maybe not so much in the scope of a career. Mm -hmm. So when I switched to music in undergrad full time in 2014, I got a lot of scrutiny specifically from people in my cultural heritage and even from my parents at times. And it wasn't so much that they were scared of how I would make this into a career. They were more scared about what the collectivist society was going to think. And even to Mm -hmm. this day, the collectivist society always finds their need to give an opinion, even when it's not asked for. Mm -hmm. Um, And in general, at the same time, you know, trying to also... Qual- uh, quantify or qualify your work against someone else's opinion is always going to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think now that I have a master's degree, people tend to take me more seriously. And that was kind of the intention of the degree, apart from getting better as an artist. And so as you have a- credibility. 
Credibility is huge, and especially in Eastern cultures, they want to see credibility. In addition to, you know, your accolades just based on what you're doing, you know, a piece of paper also does carry a long way, unfortunately. But at the same time, you know, it's nice to have that credit. Yeah. Um, I still face those challenges. And, you know, I was talking with my religious speaker yesterday, and he said that, you know, uh, because I was venting a lot about the current climate. And yeah. he said, don't, don't regard the current climate as sort of an ultimatum um for this because this is a situation that has thrown off not just people like you but like everybody mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i that's i mean to, this is a challenge i face but it's one that i think i that you know inshallah i'll overcome but there inshallah, are all yeah. there are always little things that pop in the way such as unasked cultural opinions <laughs> right so i guess um i think you partially answered it but i mean how did you overcome those challenges uh, that, that you faced? So I think I ended up realizing that if I can prove not to these people, but to myself that I can be successful in this, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, that was enough for me. Um, I didn't need to answer to anybody. Um, you know, they're not exactly governing my life because quite frankly, if I needed help from them, they probably wouldn't be helping me. These are kind of people and maybe the exception of my family, like, you know, they're always going to be my biggest support system. So I also wanted to prove to them and make them proud. Okay. Um, and then at the same time, you know, also just realizing that all these big name artists that people just tend to worship, whether it's Beyonce, Atif Aslam or whoever, nobody knew who they were until they had big names. And that's what I always tell people. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I want to, you know, make an impact on the world through my music, just like these other artists. But let's just be real. You did not know who these artists were until they became famous. Right. So the thing I can ask of you is that you at least be supportive of what I'm doing because, you know, I want to get to that level and I can't get to that level unless I do have people supporting me. Usually right. that tends to usually that tends to shut people up. <laughs> right. Right. It's I mean, it, it is an unfortunate um, reality that, you know, there's always the, the struggling, it's like under the umbrella of the struggling artist, whether it be in, you know, in any, in any type of creative work, right? You have to build your name, build a reputation. You have to be shut down so many times and, you know, before you can spring up and rise to be something great. You know? Oh, absolutely. You're going to hear a lot more no's than you're going to hear yeses. And the mm -hmm. best thing you can do is turn that no, those no's into fuel. Right. Actually be able to do something with it because... Honestly, nothing is worth achieving unless you have to work your tail off for it. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite artists, uh, Kristen Chenow, had said in a concert that it's very easy to get rich, but mm -hmm. in order for you to make an impact on something or on someone, you mm -hmm. have to work for it. You have to try. You have to fail many times. You have to learn, Absolutely. From, learn from the failures and then keep trying again. Right, right. So a big challenge that we are all facing globally is the coronavirus. And so how has this affected you and your performance? So unfortunately, a lot of things that I was looking forward to specifically in the latter part of March, all of April, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. even into August, all has been canceled, um, mm -hmm. including my what would have been my fifth year to Eisenstadt, Austria to perform in the classic music festival. Yeesh. And I would have gotten to play Beethoven's ninth as associate principal. So that was definitely like the biggest blow to me, even though I kind of expected it. Yeah. Um, because basically a lot of what an artist does relies on live performance, whether mm -hmm. it's written music, written classical music, or, you know, my non-classical stuff, which mostly I have in here. Mm -hmm. um, it relies on live performance. And as much as you can do a live stream, you can't guarantee that people will, first of all, listen, because then you've given them just a choice via a media and then also mm -hmm. as an art, also as a working individual, you're not necessarily going to make an income unless people are actually feeling generous in doing so. Right. Um, so that's definitely something that has been hard because I felt like a lot of these would have opened doors for me. I was supposed to teach in Argentina, actually leaving Monday. I was wow. actually leaving for Argentina on Monday uh, to teach at the El Sistema program. Of course, you know that all went down. Um, yeah. And so, but you know, at the same time, I, I'm assuring myself that look with this sort of happening, I would kind of already mentally prepared for a lot of things to, you know, kind of go away. Yeah. And at least if anything, they're, if, even if they're going away, they're not canceled, they're postponed. 
whether right. it's later this year or early next year or sometime mm -hmm. next year. At the same time, um, I'm also realizing, and I was talking to a friend about this, that the best is yet to come. Yeah. Because, you know, with the climate of what's going on, usually this tends to fuel people to either create some of their best stuff. And mm -hmm. yes, we don't always feel creative in the initial standpoint. I remember the first two weeks I was in Dallas and even a little bit till now, like, you know, trying to find the creative energy has always been difficult. But mm -hmm. I kind of find the creative energy just to keep myself busy and to reaffirm my sense of purpose. Right. And actually, I remember reading about this uh, a little bit ago that um, in order to be creative, you have to set yourself boundaries, whether that be in the physical space or in the mental space. So that way, that's that's where creativity is born, right? When you have those parameters set. If you go into doing a project of any sort and, you know, those who are uh, commissioning you say, you know, it's an open canvas, right? You can do whatever you want. That in itself stifles creativity because you're like, well, what's the direction? Where are we starting? From? Like, how? How, how do we go about this, right? So Absolutely. when you have when you have those boundaries, that's when beauty shines. Oh, absolutely. And in someone like me, I am very much a people's person. I'm, I'm kind of like an ex I'm an introverted extrovert, for the lack of yeah. a better way of putting it. And, you know, a lot of my energy comes from people that I get to be around. Um, and yes, I communicate with you via FaceTime and, you know, other friends via FaceTime as well. It's just not the same. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of the re one of the reasons why my energy kind of gets thrown off is because when unless I'm around these people physically, I can't, you know, take that energy and that, you know, fuels my spirit. Yes. Uh, and I and I get and, you know, sometimes, you know, you're not, you may not even be talking about art or anything. Mm -hmm. But you'll get an idea just based on how the energy of the situation is. Right. Just and the normal experiences just with social interaction. Absolutely. And even a lot of professional musicians say that they do not advocate practicing for long hours because part of what fuels musical creativity is living life. Mm -hmm. And right now, since we all sort of feel trapped and isolated, yeah. you know, that's like the only emotion we're feeling right now. Which means yeah. you can still write a lot of good literature. It's just going to have that undertow to it, yeah. um, which may or may not be a good thing. But I think yeah. at the same time, we try to make the most of the situation. I try to go for walks every day. Mm -hmm. I try to go for a drive every now and then just so I can see a little bit of what's mm -hmm. happening around me. Yeah. Um, I try to also, you know, keep myself fit and, you know, keep myself active just to keep my myself going. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I, I've been doing the same thing as well. Like uh, my wife and I will just go and just to get out of the house and, you know, be outside. It's pretty. And, you know, it's just it's it's too nice to not go outside and, and enjoy it and experience it. And that's part of it. Right. Just to experience life. And that's where inspiration comes from, motivation to oh, create. 100 percent. 100 percent. Yeah. So uh, last question how do you think your experience with being quarantined uh, will change your art moving forward? You know, um, it's allowed me to reevaluate a lot of my artistic material um, mm -hmm. such that I can, you know, distance myself from some things or like, you know, reassess other things. For example, when I did my house concert a few weeks ago, yes. I, played, I, had, I played a piece that I had not played in about five, six years. And I wow. decided I decided on doing it the night before the concert because I was wanting to just change things up. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, new instrument, new technique, I could do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the space to do it as well. Yeah. And I think I'm just going to make sure whether it's a gig that, you know, pays little or is a gig that, you know, I may not like playing the material or something like that. If it's a mm -hmm. gig in which I feel morally, ethically compromised, I'm not going to take that gig anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely going to make me relish every note that I play in every performance, no matter how tired I am, no matter how frustrated I am. Mm -hmm. Because when uh, before things started going down, we had an opera performance at UNLV. We had three consecutive concerts with three hour rehearsals leading up until we were tired. Wow. But I realized after that, that, you know, I'm glad that that opera performance was not canceled because right. that was the last live performance I gave you know, mm -hmm. with other musicians. And since I don't know when that next one's going to be, I really cherish that moment I got to have with my colleagues. Yeah. And, you know, it's definitely going to make me going forward, appreciate every moment I have to make music with other people in the mm -hmm. flesh. Yes. Yeah. 
there's always the idea of online collaborations, but nothing beats feeding off of each other's energy, you know, looking at each other, sometimes making a funny face at each other when something happens yeah. uh, in the zone. So it's definitely gonna make me love those moments a lot more. Absolutely, and I think that's, that's the key thing is uh, that ability to have social interaction and to cherish the ones that you love and to say the things that you wanted to say and do the things that you wanted to do and not waste time, you know, be, be uh, intentional with what you want to do. You took the words out of my mouth. I think having intention is so important for everything. You want every moment to mean something. Like for me, like I love being around people. I love giving hugs um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, you know, not being able to do that right now is something that is kind of affecting my mental state at times. And, I, and everyone's having mental health issues now, which is another which is another pandemic in and of itself. Right. So it definitely would allow once we return back to a form of normalcy, allow us to, you know, at least cope with these issues in a much more, I guess, informed sense now that we have gone through a phase where coping with them was harder. Yeah. When this is over, I'm going to give you a big hug. Thank you. <laughs> and so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I present Rizwan Jagani for a live performance of whatever he wants to play. So sure. give it up for Rizwan Jagani. So this is a little uh, project that I kind of put upon myself because Ramadan is coming up next week. So you might see this on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. This is a solo viola version of Maher Zain Zyanabi Salam Aleika. Allah. <laughs> and I'm just going to play a little bit of it because I don't want to spoil it for, you know, for those of you who want to see the full thing. There you go. So we're going to have a little tease. Absolutely. All right. Here we go. The stage is yours. Thank you. That was absolutely magnificent. Y'all y'all need to follow Rizwan on his social media. I do have a link to his Instagram down below. And it is, in a, it's always a treat to, to listen to such beauty, right? Coming from an amazing artist from a beautiful instrument. So Rizwan, thank you for joining me on this live stream. And uh, we will talk another time inshallah thank you inshallah. for being here thank you so much assalamu alaikum well i guess all righty y'all so thanks to everybody tuning in we really do appreciate it um if y'all enjoyed this make sure you give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe make sure you hit that post notification down below so you know when we are live again here on real time where we talk about film television and everything in between and yeah I'm very pumped for the upcoming live streams. Maybe I'll be doing stuff uh, more frequently instead of once a week. Still to be determined, but uh, y'all's feedback is greatly appreciated. Um, until then, I will see you guys in the next one. Assalamu alaikum. Peace out.